the Kamchatka Peninsula is one of the most volcanic places in the world. Beneath its calm surface, Earth remains a living planet. A group of researchers have dedicated their lives to the study of these ticking time bombs. Together with a film crew from Japan, they will explore these remarkable volcanoes like never before. Time will be tight if they are to reveal the secrets of Kamchatka's heart of fire. The expedition is underway on Russia's Kamchatka Peninsula. This enormous spit of land is roughly 1,200 kilometers long. And it has one of the highest densities of active volcanoes found anywhere in the world. The film crew start their journey in the city of Petropavlovsk, Kamchatsky. The people here live in the shadow of sleeping giants. Volcanoes surround the city on all four sides. But because of this, it is also one of the best places in the world for volcano research. The hub of which is the Russian Academy of Sciences. The film crew has come here to follow this team of remarkable volcanologists as they unlock the secrets of the planet. Eager to start their epic expedition, the crew meets with the head of the research team, Dr. Sergei Samolienko. He is interested in one volcano in particular, Shivaluch. Lying directly above it is a busy flight path. And if ash from an eruption got into an aircraft's engines, it could cause a major disaster. Being able to predict these eruptions has never been more urgent. With no time to waste, the team sets off for Shivaluch. Natalia Gorbach has been studying this volcano for over 10 years. She explains to the film crew that of all the volcanoes in Kamchatka, Shivaluch is considered the most dangerous due to its huge pyroclastic flow. In an eruption in 2002, this deadly secret became clear. 
scorching gas and rock up to 700 degrees centigrade rush down the volcano, engulfing everything in its path. The team will have to keep their eyes peeled for any sign of an eruption. Their lives will depend on it. Finally, they arrive in the village of Esso. This is as far as the team can get by bus. From here on in, they will have to approach the volcano from the air. Usually, this helicopter is used to transport supplies to remote mine sites and camps. This time, though, it will have a different mission. The rear of the fuselage can be completely opened. This will make the job of loading their equipment a lot easier. Sergei is also anxious to check the weather forecast with their pilot. The flight is scheduled for tomorrow, but the weather around Shivalaj is causing the researchers some concern. Yevgeny, the team's helicopter pilot, knows this area like the back of his hand, but the weather is concerning him too. He explains that today cloud is covering the volcano at around 500 to 600 meters. The team could fly, but the visibility would be so bad that the researchers would not be able to see anything. Two days later, the sun finally appears and the expedition can get underway. <laughs> Natalia confirms the final route and landing spot with Yevgeny. The plan is to survey three volcanic areas. First, they will investigate the pyroclastic flow at the foot of the volcano. Second, they will land close to the crater and assess the lava dome. And finally, they will conduct an aerial survey. This will allow Natalia to spot any telltale signs of an impending eruption. At last, the team is ready for takeoff. Filming will be done through the helicopter's open door. Because of the strong winds, Yevgeny will have to pilot the helicopter extremely carefully. Shortly after takeoff, the team is treated to some of Kamchatka's breathtaking scenery. Finally, the team catches their first glimpse on the horizon. Shivalich Volcano.
Its summit towers at a height of over 3,000 meters. They are now 20 kilometers from the crater and the ground has completely changed. This barren land was carved out by a huge pyroclastic flow from an eruption in 1964. Once carpeted in forest, the flow's destructive power flattened an area of 250 square kilometers. Nothing could escape its terrifying reach. As they get ever closer, the team spot the aftermath of an even more recent pyroclastic flow. In 2010, an explosive eruption sent a large amount of lava and ash rushing down the volcano, scorching all in its path. Kilometers from the crater, the helicopter begins its descent. They are landing in an area that was burnt by yet another pyroclastic flow in 2005. Small patches of grass are only just beginning to grow back. This footage was filmed just a few days after it occurred. The devastation was total. What was once lush vegetation was scorched in seconds. For the first time in two years, Natalia is back. The researchers set off straight away to assess the volcano's condition. The awesome destructive power of Shivaluch can be seen everywhere, even in unexpected places. These giant rocks stand three stories high, but they've not always been here. They once formed part of the lava dome on the summit, but during an explosive eruption, they were jettisoned eight kilometers down the volcano. This dome is key to understanding Shivaluch's destructive power. Its magma is sticky, and rather than flowing out straight away, the lava bulges and hardens, forming a lava dome. But trapped within the dome, the magma pressure increases until it explodes, releasing a superheated avalanche of gas, stone and lava. Shivaluch, this endless cycle just repeats and repeats itself. Natalia collects a piece of the old lava dome and uses GPS to pinpoint the location. By measuring the distance that the dome has traveled, she can work out the power of the explosion. Because of this constant risk of an eruption, Sergei has his telescope trained on Shivaluch's summit, eight kilometers away.
He tells the team that the flow traveled at a speed of between 150 and 200 kilometers per hour. The eruption in 1964 yielded 800 megatons of destructive power. At those speeds, a pyroclastic flow would reach the spot where they are walking in less than three minutes. Eager to reach the dome, the team get back into the air. This time, the landing site will only be a few hundred meters from the crater. The huge lava dome looms dead ahead. Natalia has to guide the pilot to the landing spot. Any mistake here could be fatal. The team is heading over the ridge, the opposite side to the last pyroclastic flow. If by any chance an eruption occurs, they will at least be avoiding the risk of being caught in the scorching flow. In order to make sure the terrain isn't too uneven to land, the helicopter flies low, almost skimming the ground, and the mechanic jumps out to help guide the landing. As a precaution, in case of an emergency, the pilot will keep the helicopter's rotors constantly turning. The dome has expanded much more than Natalia expected and has grown in height by almost half a kilometer. She tells the team that this is extremely dangerous. They are now only about 350 meters away. They must only stay here for a short period of time. If there is any change in the lava dome at all, they will have to evacuate immediately. As soon as the scientists have the readings they need, they must get back into the air. To get the full picture, they need to now survey the dome from above. White smoke billowing from the peak is a stark reminder of the destructive forces at work beneath the dome. Natalia has noticed something unusual. The lava at the peak has formed into a strange shape, almost like a rose in full bloom. When the lava forms in this way, it signals an imminent eruption. The team cannot stay in the air above the explosive dome for too long. Many of Kamchatka's volcanoes are located on the southeast mountain belt. This is thought to be because the Pacific Plate pushes up against the peninsula, where it then sinks underneath Kamchatka. As it plunges deep into the hot interior of the planet, parts of the mantle melt 
and magma is formed. It then rises to the surface, forming chambers where it will eventually break through and form another of Kamchatka's volcanoes. After the success of studying Shivaluch, the team is busy planning another expedition to a volcano known as Kizaman. Alexander Ovzyanikov is the leading scientist on Kizaman. His area of expertise is lava flow. It will need meticulous planning, and the researchers have to decide on the safest place to land and evacuate if there was a sudden eruption. With Alexander at the helm of the team, the helicopter sets off for Kizimun. It lies about 150 kilometers southeast of Esso, right in the center of Kamchatka's mountain belt. The plan is to land next to Kizimun's lava flow while the scientists conduct their research. Before they reach the volcano, the team has to land in a safe zone to set up some unique equipment. They will be using a specialist aerial camera to determine the exact scale of the lava flow. A panel on the floor of the helicopter has been modified for this special camera. Infrared imagery will also be used to measure the exact temperature of the lava. Final preparations over, the team can finally get on their way. And not long afterwards, the team is treated to a monumental sight. Kizaman. A strange mound runs all the way from the summit. This is the great lava flow. Instead of petering out at the foot of the mountain, Kizaman's lava flow stops to form a towering cliff face. It's a perfect time for the researchers to test their infrared camera. But when they do, it reveals something completely unexpected. The temperature near the crater is over 500 degrees centigrade, as normal. But it also reveals blistering heat sources at the end of the lava flow. The team is going to head down to take a closer look. 
once again the scientists guide their pilot to the landing spot. But there's a problem. The helicopter's rotors begin to stir up a large amount of volcanic ash. If this ash gets sucked into the helicopter's engines, there is a very real risk of crashing. The visibility becomes nil. They have to get out of this cloud. The team has no choice but to abort. After much discussion, they decide the ground near the lake will contain more moisture and so the ash should be less likely to fly up. The mechanic jumps down and checks the ground prior to landing. Eager to get on, as soon as the team land, they stride off towards the cliff. Huge rocks which have fallen down from the top of the flow litter the ground. The lava flow towers a full 200 meters above the team. It's almost a mountain in its own right. Signs of volcanic activity are everywhere, and the team must watch their step. Directly underneath the surface lies scorching lava. Even whilst they stand here, rocks and stones race down the cliff face. They can't get any closer than this. These falling rocks are evidence that the lava flow is constantly on the move. Using the infrared camera, the scientists want to find out what is going on inside the flow and how this restless giant is moving. The camera reveals that the hottest parts are at the top of the cliff, showing that lava is accumulating there. Kizaman's lava is strong and viscous, meaning that it travels down slowly from the crater. Gradually, as it travels down the mountainside, it cools and hardens. As the downward slope becomes less steep, the lava flow eventually comes to a rest. But the constant flow from the crater travels down and forms new layers over the already solidified lava. The result is that the lava flow continues to endlessly grow in height. Alexander tells the team that he finds the scale of this lava flow fascinating. He thinks this is the highest lava flow in the world. 
to accurately observe any changes to the flow, they must once again take to the air. By comparing aerial photographs taken today with those taken in 2011, Alexander will be able to calculate how much the lava flow has grown. According to the results of the 2011 survey, the lava flow was around 2.1 kilometers long and 200 meters high. Ten months later, the lava flow has grown another 1.4 kilometers in length and 60 meters in height. This equals a growth rate of 4.7 meters in length and 20 centimeters in height every single day. Far from being a sleeping giant, Kizerman is constantly on the move. Only time will tell how far this remarkable lava flow will travel before it finally comes to rest. Back at the research centre, Sergei is planning an expedition to one of Kamchatka's most active volcanoes. Gorli. Sergei has heard that a large amount of volcanic gas is now belching out from a hole in its crater. This time, the team will need backup. These twin brothers are the only two people in the world to have ever set foot in Gorley's crater. Their knowledge of the volcano is going to be vital if Sergei is to succeed. With the team together, they finally set off. Ilya researches volcanic gases at the Russian Academy of Sciences. And his younger brother, Oleg, is an expert in mineral extraction. It is a long cross-country drive through perilous mountain passes. But there is no turning back now. After four hours of driving, they finally reached the Great Gorley Volcano. From here, the team will have to hike the rest of the way to the summit. Once they have reached the peak at over 1800 meters, they will begin their search for the fumarole which is spewing out the volcanic gases. The fumarole they are aiming for lies deep inside the crater. It will take all of the team's strength to make the arduous climb. They decide to pitch camp for the evening and start the trek fresh in the morning. Sergei briefs the team and decides that they're going to aim to leave camp at 8 a.m. to start the long climb to the crater.
The next morning, the team is once more gearing up to attempt the trek to the funeral. Sergei wraps his feet in cloth. This will protect them against the heat from the hot lava underfoot. With everyone ready to go, they finally set off for the summit. It's five kilometers to the crater and the route up is tough. The team will have to pull together if they are to make it to the top. Three long hours later, they finally reach the summit. From here, the team will have to hike around the rim to reach the neighboring crater. After another hour of walking, they finally reach the crater containing the fumarole. But something is different. A terrifying roar echoes from deep within the crater. <laughs> And according to the brothers, when they were last here, there was much more water in the crater lake than there is now. Finally, Sergei spots the fumarole. The ominous sound that the team heard earlier is coming from there too. To get there, the team must walk around the crater rim to the opposite side. The slopes of the crater are extremely unstable, so the team can only traverse so far. They will then have to abseil down to the lake and carefully approach from below. At its narrowest, the crater's edge is only two meters wide, with sheer cliffs on either side. The journey to the fumarole is much more physically demanding than the team could ever have imagined. After another hour of walking, they are now just 80 meters away, and they have a clear line of sight to the fumarole. The noise is deafening. The surrounding rocks have been stained a bright yellow. This is due to the high sulfur content in the volcanic gases. Sergei explains that these gases separate from the magma deep within the Earth's crust. The gases are at an extremely high pressure. So if there's any holes in the ground, they come rushing out at phenomenal speeds. 
In order to properly assess its condition, the researchers need to get closer. Leaving the film crew behind, the team head off to scout the way forward. The only route to the fumarole is to abseil down. But excess meltwater has formed a waterfall over the cliff, making it impossible for the team to continue. To attempt the abseil would mean dicing with death. It's unfortunate that the researchers have to stop here, but there is no other way down and they are forced to turn back. Ilya and Oleg, however, think differently. They decide to stay behind in the crater and see if the situation improves. A few days later, the amount of meltwater running down the cliff face has reduced, and the brothers decide to attempt a daring descent. As they make their final preparations, everything must be checked and rechecked. In order to get down to the fumarole, the brothers have to get everything just right. One mistake here could be fatal. They've made it. They are now just 60 meters away. Step by step, the brothers edge their way closer and closer. Finally, against all the odds, they've made it to the great fumarole. will have to plan his approach with extreme caution. To protect himself from the toxic volcanic gases, he has to wear a gas mask. Then, he gets closer than ever. Using a special thermometer, Ilya records the temperature of the volcanic gases. A year ago, it was 900 degrees centigrade and they have to take its temperature for any signs of an impending eruption. Mm. 
whilst withstanding the intense heat, Ilya takes the measurement. One thousand and sixty degrees centigrade. One hundred and sixty degrees hotter than last year. The brothers must watch where they stand. The blistering heat of the volcanic gases is melting the very ground beneath their feet. demonstrate the powerful forces at work, one of the brothers throws a large rock into the mouth of the hole. But the gases, traveling at 200 meters a second, just spit it straight back out. No other fumarole in the world can compare to this one. All the warning signs point to an eruption in the near future, possibly from this very spot. Sergei and his team will have to monitor this situation closely if they are to truly understand the secrets of Kamchatka's heart of fire. This expedition has helped researchers understand more about the volcanoes of Kamchatka than ever before. Only time will tell which of the volcanoes will erupt next. But there is no doubt that Kamchatka's intrepid volcanologists will be the first on the scene.